Now, without wasting much time, we have today a very wonderful man of God who is going to be ministering to us in a little while from now. And uh, it is such a great joy for me to welcome into our church this great friend of our church and a great friend of our ministry. I've been associated with the Reinhard Monke, Christ for All Nation Ministries, for close to over, close to over 35 years now. I got to know Bonke when I was in India in 1982. And later on, when I came back in 1988, I had the privilege of receiving him to Kenya for the first conference that we were hosting in Nairobi. And thereafter, we've been friends with the team for a long time. But today, we are very privileged. Reinhard Bonke is in heaven with the Lord. Today, we have Reverend Kolenda, who is running that ministry. But we are very happy to have the financial director of Sifan, the man who carries all the monies that we use on crusades, and who makes sure that we are okay and the gospel is being preached, he's with us in the church. Amen. And I want to take this opportunity to welcome him and his wife to come to fellowship together with us today. We have with us Pastor, German, German names are hard. So please bear with me. I, try, I asked him to, tell, to help me get to, to write it in Swahili. And in Swahili, it's simply seek free. Seek free. In Germany, it's seek free, yes, but... If you read it, you will not read it as sick freight. You'll read as saying freak day. So I can't read that one. His name is simply sick free. All right? Sick free. And if I want to make it much easier, sick free Thomas. This is the man who is with us in the house this morning. He's been involved with Sifan for a very long time. Actually, he's the president of Mission Services Incorporation. He's the CEO of One God, One Day, One Africa. Uh, a ministry that ministers, I believe, in Africa and some other areas of Africa. Executive Director of Global Evangelism Alliance. Again, that's what he does. And by God's grace, in 1994, this man joined Sifan, Christ for Nations. And for 18 years, by the grace of God, he has done ministry alongside Reinhard Bonke, preaching alongside him in many of the crusades they have held all over Africa, and also doing what we normally call as the fire conferences, where pastors and church leaders are brought together to be minister to during those conferences. Uh, he has actually been part of the leadership in Sifan from that particular time. In the year 2012, he began a ministry which is called Calling Ministry, uh, which actually currently is, uh, is following the calling of God upon his life to preach, teach, and serve with special focus on Europe and North Africa, the areas of uh, Morocco, uh, Egypt, those other areas where Islam has taken hold and taken control of. Our brother God has given him the burden to be in those areas. In fact, next week he's going to be ministering in Egypt. Now, he is also Sifan's crusade treasurer. He is very much involved in the crusade ministries now in Africa and in other places together with uh, Daniel Kolenda. I'm sure all of us know who Daniel Kolenda is. Now, Reverend Sickfield, uh, Sick Free. <laughs> is passionate in evangelism. He's a conference speaker, he's also a mentor, he's a trainer, and he's also a teacher. I had time to sit with him and I could sense the depth of God's word in him and the depth of the anointing that God has given to him. And we were so much blessed in our second service to have him minister to us here, those who are here. God has blessed him with a family. They got married in 1982. His wonderful wife is around. She loves to take pictures. And I think she's standing right there in the corner taking some pictures there. And uh, they have been blessed with four children, adult children, four grandchildren, and their children also love the Lord and they are serving God, I mean, together with them in different areas of ministry. I'm so happy and we are so glad that this man could find time in his busy schedule to be together with us. And I believe you will love him. You know, Germans have a, an accent, but this man has been living in the U.S., so he, has, he speaks very good English, believe me. His English is very good. But when I look at him, I see a duplicate of Bonke. He seems to be Bonke's brother from another mother. The only thing is that he has white hair, Bonke had black hair. But the way he speaks is like Reinhard Bonke. So I am not missing Bonke anymore. I think by having him here, I have Reinhard Bonke in a different form. Let me take this opportunity to thank him for coming to be with us. They live in Florida, and uh, his ministry began in Germany, and he also does ministry in Germany and South Africa. Are you delighted to have this man of God come to speak to us? He has 40 minutes to share the word of God with us. Put your hands together one more time and let's welcome the man of God to minister to I was so blessed in the second service. 
God bless you. Asante sana, Bishop. <laughs> and Asante sana, First Lady, for allowing us to be here today. It's, uh, it's a true blessing. It's a, a joy and I must really say an honor to be here with you. I just want to set my time because evangelists tend to forget the time and I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Wana sifuwe Yesu. Amen. We have traveling Africa, crisscrossing the continent of Africa for some decades already. And uh, I said in the first service already, I've been from Fiji to Hawaii, from Alaska down to Cape Town. And there is wonderful places, but my heart, and that's the bottom of my heart with all truth, my heart is in Africa. We are Africans from top to toe. We love Africa. And we will continue to serve God in Africa as long as we have breath. And as long the Lord allows us to do that. Um, there is no other place. And I, I want to quickly share you why. Um, and that's what we, I experience when we travel throughout the world. You know, many of our people in, in Europe, and I was born in Germany, I was raised in Canada, I lived in Dubai as a missionary. Um, we have children all over the world, in Liberia and in Germany, in America. And then when I come to, to Germany, they remind me of the first missionaries. And from our own church, we had some of the first missionaries coming to Kenya, Machimoto, uh, Nakuru, Kisumu, and so on. And I remember those days, I was a little boy, and they told me, you know, we are going to the dark continent, because they were proud to come from the German religious background lighthouse. Germany was a very religious country once, and they sent the missionaries to Africa. What I see today, when I travel throughout Africa, I see that Africa has become the lighthouse of the world and brings the light to the secular and dark continents in the Western world. Some of the fastest growing and largest churches in Europe are African churches. They are growing, why? Because they have a fire, they have a love for Jesus Christ. There is not only a passion, there is also, it's combined with compassion for the lost. You know, when we only have passion, that's what the Germans do. They have passion for the lost and for the social uh, 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 discouraged and displaced. So they do a lot of social work. That's passion. Some have compassion, you know. But if we only have passion or compassion, it doesn't work. We need both. We need the passion of Jesus Christ for the people. And then we need to serve them with compassion, right? So I don't want to share much about my ministry or our ministry. That's not what I'm here today because I'm here on a special assignment. The assignment is to share with you the Word of God. It's not about me. It's not about the ministry. When I prayed just a couple of minutes ago, I had one prayer. I said, Lord, all I want the people is to see you today. Forget about me. Forget about everything. When you look here, don't look at me. Look at Jesus. And I pray that we have a real encounter with Jesus Christ this morning. If we go home and we know we have met with Jesus, then you have met the right person. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't want to preach wonderful messages. We want the people to experience Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. I want to read a scripture with you. And I actually want to share about that scripture. I'm not going to read it all because it's too long. But it's from Luke 24, verses 13 to 36. And I give you quickly a background about what happened here. Number one, we just come from Easter. We know Jesus Christ died on the cross. He gave his life for the sins of the world. He died there. And you know, when I see Jesus hanging on the cross, stretching out his arms, I'm reminded of the Old Testament prophetic word where, G where God speaks to the people. He says, I have stretched out my arms day and night to a rebellious people. And the people in the Old Testament, they have heard the voice of God. But they didn't really understand it. Now, when Jesus came, I believe he visualized the old prophetic word by hanging on the cross, stretching out his arms, 
And crying out, I have stretched out my arms for you. And I believe Jesus still has stretched out his hands, his arms for us today. Then Jesus died, and when Jesus died, all the dreams and all the visions and all the hopes of the, the disciples, they died with Jesus. And then we know Resurrection Day, Easter, we just come a couple of days out of Easter. We are living right in that period today. And the people, some had met Jesus during that period of time. But what we read here, those people have not met Jesus yet. They didn't hear about it. Suddenly, you know, they walk back home. Two of those people going back home in a, in, to a town called Emmaus. And, you know, they didn't come back from a football game where their team won. They didn't go home and say, wow, wasn't this wonderful what we experienced in Jerusalem? No, there was no hope. There was no joy in those two guys, in those two fellows. You know what I can imagine? It doesn't say that, but what I imagine is they walked like that. You know, it's all so hopeless. You know, it's so terrible. You know, Jesus died. We put all our hope on this man, and now he's dead. And I believe one discouraged the other. One discouraged the other one, and their mood went down more and more. I don't like to be around people who are discouraged. I don't like to be around people who discourage me, who take all my hope. I love to be around people who encourage me, who give me hope. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. So we need to encourage one another, especially in this time. There are so many people, millions of people right now, in this generation, in this season, in this time, we are Are living, who are hopeless, who are discouraged. I was just three weeks in Germany, and you should hear the Germans how discouraged, how afraid, how fearful they are. And they remind me of these two people. You know, it, it all stops. The world is going to stop turning. Now this is the end, and, and you know, we have to stay home. We cannot share the gospel anymore. Don't believe the lies of the devil. We are living in the best times ever. We have the greatest opportunities. We just need to make use of them. And what happens when, as they are walking like that, discouraged, hopeless, suddenly somebody moves along and walks with them. And then they look at him and they don't recognize him. But they think, you know, where do you come from? Don't you know what's happening? Don't you know what just happened in, in Jerusalem? You know, they thought he just fell down from the moon. Where does this man come from? He doesn't know anything what happened. And then suddenly this man starts to explain from the Old Testament, from the scriptures, what happened. And the Bible says he explained it, he explained the word, and Jesus is the word. So if you are with me, understand that. Jesus explained himself with himself. And that's the best way. When you share the gospel, share the gospel by sharing Jesus. That's the best thing you can do. Don't talk to them about politics, about religion, about anything. Talk to them about Jesus Christ. Paul says, I preach Christ crucified. That's all we need to do. And suddenly they felt something. There's something different when this man talks to us. Let me read a couple of verses here out of that chapter. In the beginning it says, Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus. Now it continues. Verse 16. But their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. They did not know him. But suddenly something happens. They feel something. Their heart beats you know, maybe 60, suddenly starts going 80, 85, 90, 100. They don't know what's going on. I've been around people, you know, where I realized there's something, there's something special. There's a special anointing in their presence. Can I tell you a secret? When we were together on Friday, I was sitting with the bishop. I felt that same. There's a heartbeat. And when he was speaking and sharing, only those few minutes, I, I realized we have the same temperature. But I really have something, and I did not say that in the first service, but I want to say that today, and I want that to be broadcasted worldwide. There is, there is no man I've ever seen in my life with a vision you have. Structured, strategized, a heart for the children, a heart for the teenagers, a heart for the adults, a heart for the people, a man with a heart of God. And let me tell you one thing. 
There is only a few people that are mentioned in the Bible where it says he was a man after God's heart. And I, I hear the voice of God saying, I found a man after my own heart. It's you, Bishop. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now here it continues, verse 32. And they said to one another, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us? So they realized something was happening in their heart. There was a glimpse. There was a little ignition and a little igniter. And then it continues, verse 33. So they rose up that very, oh, sorry, verse 32. And they said to one another, did not have uh, a... Uh, did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us? Now something happened. They went together into the house and then Jesus broke the bread. And suddenly their eyes were opened and they understood when Jesus broke the bread, they realized that symbol Jesus himself told them before. And the breaking of the bread was breaking his own body for them. And then they went back. They went back, why? They needed to tell the others what they had experienced. There was something when Jesus rose from the dead. Did you go home to the disciples that, did you go home to the disciples that, mm, you know, I'm not quite sure what happened. That was interesting, but you know, Jesus died. No. You know what it says? And she ran to tell the others. Suddenly, we remember Peter, such a strong man. They were hiding places. Now they also came to the grave. They looked into the tomb. What did they see? Nothing. The other disciples came, looked into the grave. What did they see? Nothing. They saw nothing. And they went back. The Bible says they went back troubled. They thought, what's going on? Maybe you have come to church for many times, and you go home, it's like you looked into an empty tomb. But I believe this morning there will be a difference. You will have an encounter like Mary with the living Son of God, with Jesus Christ, and you will run home. Why? Because if we have an encounter with Jesus Christ, our life will not be the same anymore. And it continues here. Now it comes. And they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven. Now as they said these things, Jesus himself, because they were locked up, himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Oh, you fools, I can't do anything with you. No, he said, peace, peace, calm down. In this turmoil, in this chaotic situation we are all in, I believe Jesus wants to encourage us. He says, peace, don't be afraid. Don't be fearful anymore. I believe when the Holy Spirit comes, all fear will be gone. He will bring us boldness into our hearts. Now the disciples who had dreams, the dreams were their own dreams. They thought they will reign with Jesus one day in Israel. They will cast out the Romans. They had their own thoughts. They had their own visions. What would happen if they followed Jesus? When Jesus died, I say it again. Their dreams and visions died. And I don't know about you, young men, young women, old people. If you have your own dreams, they will die. But if you will start dreaming God's dreams and you will have God's visions, they will change not only your life, but they will change this generation. Now it says, didn't our hearts burn within us? They, they experienced a little glimpse. There was something like a little gloucester, like a little spark of flame. And I realized when we look into the world, there are so many people, they have a passion. They are burning. There is a fervency. I was about 14 years old. Just one year before I left home, I left the church. It was actually when I was 15. It was an, a, a revival meeting. We had an evangelist in our church. My parents were church members. My father was an elder. They were sitting in the front row. I was sitting somewhere there. And then the preacher shared a gospel message and he made an altar call. He said, take Jesus, all of him, or leave it at all. So I was the first one to the altar at the end of the meeting. And I stretched out my hand to the preacher and I said, I made a decision. He looked at me smiling and I said, I want to leave it all. 
He looked at me. Didn't he understand? I said, I will leave it all. I don't want nothing to do with it anymore. I walked out. I ran away from home. I went to Canada. I lived my own life. I went into sin, into drug, into everything. My parents sitting there, their jaw went down. They started with tears in their eyes. Their heart was broken. I was always serious. Either do it all or leave it all. But one year before that, I was still in church. And then some of my friends gave me a ticket for a football, a soccer game. I believe Kenyans love soccer, right? <laughs> it's no sin to speak about, about soccer here in Kenya. And I didn't understand much about soccer, but they gave me that ticket. It was a game, Poland versus Argentina. Why? My last name is actually Polish background. You wouldn't know how to pronounce it, Tomaszewski. <laughs> so, and the Polish goalkeeper at that time, his name is also Tomaszewski. We are somewhere far related. And that's why my friend bought me for my 14th birthday that ticket. I went to the city, I went to the stadium. I didn't understand much. I knew my seat and my row number. And because of my Polish background somewhere, I bought a Polish flag. And I went because I thought that's what they do, you know, with the football games. I took the flag, I took my seat, and then the game starts. Poland starts to run towards the Argentinian goal. And I stood up, I waved my flag, I shouted, Poland, Poland. I was amazed because nobody else was standing up. But I saw on the other side of the stadium, I saw a lot of people shouting, Poland. I didn't understand I was on the wrong side of the stadium. <laughs> what happened? All around me were Argentinians. I was a small boy. Now Poland missed. Then Argentina started running towards the Polish goal. All these guys, you know, strong, big guys stood up shouting, Argentina, over my shoulder. I became smaller and smaller. I took my flag, I put it under my chair. I thought, I'm not going to stand up anymore. If I stand up one more time, they are going to kill me. <laughs> there was a fire in these guys. There was a fire in me, but not long. You know, when they stood up, my fire extinguished. It went down. <laughs> and when I saw all the Polish guys shouting when they lost, they went home like the, the disciples going to Emmaus. Oh, it was all hopeless. You know, we lost, we lost, we lost. How are you going home? I lost, I lost. Or are we going home today? Because we are on the victorious side. We've got Jesus in us. We have won already because Jesus won the victory at the cross of Calvary. Amen? How are you going home? So that's what happened here. And then I see there is, there is not only that fire, you know, in the fervency for football, for sports. There is also what I call the religious fire. There is people who have real a religious fire. It's not only about different, different religions. Sometimes we think, you know, those people in North Africa or other parts of the world, we have a fire against them and they have a fire against us. It's also in some areas Christians against Christians. In Europe, for many years, until just not long ago, there was Christians, brothers, fighting about their own family members in Ireland. Why? Because there is a, a religious fervency that's inside of them. But that's also not the fire I'm talking about. When I got married 39 years ago, before that, something happened inside of me. When I met my wife the first time, something happened. I fell in love. Now, I'm not talking to you guys, young guys. You don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm talking about the older here who know what I'm talking about. You know, when that happens, you know what's going on. And then sometimes you get crazy. You do things you would not do under normal circumstances. <laughs> My wife was living on a, on a hill about 32 kilometers away. And I started walking after the night service at 10 o'clock. I started walking up the hill just to see her for 10 minutes <laughs> in the middle of the night. Why? Because there was such a great love inside of me. You know, 39 years married. It's wonderful. But now I'm very honest. This fire is not always burning so high. <laughs> and to be very honest, I believe there was times where I would not have walked 32 kilometers. <laughs> it was sometimes like the devil has put an ice cube in my heart. 
Don't allow the devil to put any ice cubes in the heart. But I tell you one thing, if the love of Christ, if the Holy Spirit comes, all the ice cubes of the devil will melt because he has the fire that will melt everything in our life. We are not depending on circumstances. So there is a great love for my wife and nothing can stop that. But that's not the fire I'm talking about. There is something else I believe we need to experience today in this world. When the disciples said here, there is something burning in our heart, they got a glimpse and an idea of already what would happen just a few days later. They did not experience Pentecost yet, but they realized already there is something else. There is something more than just having, uh, you know, to know about Jesus or to, to meet Jesus somewhere on the marketplace. There is more in life about that. And they went back and they told everybody about it. They needed to have that encounter with Jesus Christ in order to tell everyone. We need an encounter with Jesus Christ today. Moses, it says, he had an encounter with God at the burning bush. Abraham had an encounter. We all need that same encounter where we experience God's grace, God's love, God's vision for our own life. And that changed the life of the people when they had that encounter. I wrote down one sentence for me here. Fire against fear, frustration, and falling. This is what we need. The fire of God in our life. That keeps us from frustration, from fear, and from falling. And that comes with the anointing of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our life. That fire that the disciples received just days later... It's called the anointing of God on our life that we need. And this promise is not only given to some of the disciples. It was not only given to the 120 on the upper room. When we continue reading the book of Acts, we see that days later, weeks later, months later, years later, even 28 years later, the same happened again and again and again. It happened in Azusa Street. It happened 1960. It happened 1980. It happened 2000. It happens today. Why? Because Jesus says, I will never change, and the Holy Spirit never changes, and His work will never change. His work is to come and fill us, empower us, not only just a little ignition, and we feel something, oh, it's nice, it's warm here, it's, 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 it's nice, I like it. No, He wants to ignite us and fill us with the power of God for our own life. We need that infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, number one, the anointing is not for some special people who are holy. Some say, well, we need to become holy first before we receive the Holy Spirit. No, it's nonsense. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes us holy. We need the Holy Spirit We need the Holy Spirit. It's not for some people, it's for all people. It's not for the people 2,000 years ago. It's for all people, for all times. If we receive Him, if we receive the promise He has given to us. Now let me read another scripture here very quickly. Isaiah 10, 27. It says, And it shall come to pass that in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. In the Old Testament, this word in Hebrew is, is used for the oil actually, the anointing oil. Now what does it say here? Let me give you a quick background. In the Western world, they don't really understand what it means, but you know what a yoke is, right? A yoke, a piece of wood that's used by ox or by donkey or by the cow and many times also by people. One piece of wood put on their shoulder, on their neck, on the left and right side sometimes buckets to bring some water from the well to the house. And then when I read that sometime back already, I realized there is many Christians, they walk around with such a yoke. It's not only the yoke of sin that the world is carrying. It's also people who are carrying the yoke of fear, of sickness, of depression. Many things they are carrying on their shoulder. 
And there it does not say that he has come to take away the yoke from us and put it at the foot of the altar. And in that, when I read that, I realized some people are coming to church with their yoke, with the buckets filled with junk, with trash, with sin, with all the heavy burdens. And they come to the altar, they put the yoke down, and then the worship starts. Thank you, worship team. You are excellent. I really love you. I really love you. I feel like young again, I tell you. And there is really an anointing. Keep doing what you are doing, worshiping God. And then they come and the people feel so happy, so released. And there is such a wonderful atmosphere. And when the preacher says amen, they take the yoke again, they put it on their shoulder, and they go home. Oh, hang on. They pour out the junk out of their buckets, and they get a refill. I don't ever read in the Bible anything about a refill. <laughs> I will explain that in a minute. And then they think they get a refill of water, and they go out, and they don't know that within short time, the devil is putting holes in those buckets. And on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the buckets are empty, and they are carrying those heavy yokes and the devil is filling them again with all kinds of trash and junk. This is not what the Bible says. You know what the Bible says? That the yoke will be broken. <laughs> It's broken. The anointing breaks the yoke. And my friend, if you have come this morning with any yoke here in this sanctuary or on the screen, if there is any yoke on your shoulder, every sickness, every curse, every sin will be broken in the name of Jesus by the anointing. Receive it. The yoke has been broken. And then it says here in first, second Timothy, for God has not given us a spirit of fear. Why? Because he has given us a spirit of power, of love, and a sound mind. If we only had power, I see the great wisdom of God in here. If he only gives us power, sometimes we would do foolish things with the power. If we only have love, sometimes it would end up in just social works. But then it says here, he has given us a spirit of power and love and a sound mind, or another translation of, says, of discernment. That means to understand when to use what and how to use it. And in the combination of power and love, we will fulfill the work of God in our life. We need both. We need power. We need love. But we also need the clear understanding. I have met Christians. They are hotheads. They are hotheads with a cold heart. This is not what God wants. He's looking for men and women with a hot heart with a cool mind. Hot heart and a cool mind. Because he has never said he will, he will uh, ignite our brain. He says he wants to set our hearts on fire to burn for Jesus. I don't know about you, but my heart is burning for Jesus. My heart is burning for Jesus. When I got saved, <clears throat> I was 21. My life was completely changed in one prayer meeting. We had a huge prayer meeting, five young people in that room. <laughs> I was a fighter, Yudoka. I was terrible, I was in sin. And one young man, he asked me again and again and again to come. I said, no, I'm not coming. He knocked at my door every Monday night, come to the meeting. I said, Jan, if you come one more time, I'm going to beat you up. He says, okay, I'll come next Monday. I said, how crazy can you be knowing I beat you up. So I said, let's make a deal. I made a deal with him. I come tonight and then you leave me alone forever. What I did not know was those five people, my wife was one of them, those five people had prayed and fasted for me. And when I arrived, I thought because I had a Pentecostal background, now they will all jump on me and cast out demons. I was disappointed. Number one, five young kids and nobody came and jumped on me. So the, the girl was reading a scripture, they knelt down, so I felt funny, I also knelt down. That moment, it was like the presence of God entered that room. I saw myself at the edge of a, a, a very deep rift, a, a valley, and I felt the power of the devil trying to kill me, to throw me down. I knew this is the end of my life. Suddenly, I see on the other side of that valley, a cross being raised up, lifted up raised high. And from that cross, I saw a hand reaching out over that valley. And I heard the voice of Jesus Christ, Siegfried, this is your last change. Take my hand. 
I don't know how long I've been laying on that floor. The young people didn't take notice. They thought, Jesus is dealing with him. We don't need to deal with him. But when I got up, my sins were forgiven. My life was completely changed. I was delivered from drugs, from anything in my life. I got filled that very moment, that very night, with the power of the Holy Spirit. There was a fire that started burning inside of me. On Saturday, they followed the same week, Saturday, I went to the marketplace. I was 21. I didn't know how to preach, but I shared my gospel on that marketplace. I just took a, an empty box and stood on that. On Sunday morning, I went to church for the first time for a long time. And one of the elders, nice, you know, like me today, gray hair, old guy, he was so friendly. He put his arm around me and he said, oh, it's so wonderful. You know, when I was young, I've also been burning like you. I stepped back and I made a vow to God 43 years ago. And I said, Lord, never in my life let come a day where I will say the fire has once been burning. I tell you, the fire has been burning more and more and hotter and hotter. Don't allow the devil to put lies in your ear. If the fire of God starts burning, it will continue burning. And then I want to close here. Joel 2.28. It's an old Testament prophetic word where we see rephrased in Acts 2 it says and it shall come to pass in the last days says God that I will pour out of my spirit on some flesh oh somebody's listening here I will pour it off my sp out of my spirit on let's say that together on all flesh on all flesh. Now, I would like to, for you to pinch yourself a little bit. You're not made of steel, not of wood. No, you're made of flesh. So this prophecy is for you as much as it is for me. We just need to receive it by faith. I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh on me, Lord Jesus. And then it says, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, not television. <laughs> Your old men shall dream dreams. While we were praying, the Lord showed me a man. You had your own visions about your life. And it's not long ago. You started something fresh. It was like a business. You started, you had your vision. And suddenly, everything got lost. And it was like your vision vanished. And you are here today. And you say, how can I do that? I'm even ashamed to mention it. I'm ashamed to mention what happened. Maybe you have not even to told anybody. But I want to tell you one thing. Jesus knows. Jesus doesn't only hear, but he's here to help you out of that situation. And he wants to fill you with his divine vision, a new purpose for your life. Listen, young man, there is a purpose on your life. And if you allow him to put his vision into your heart, because it's his, his vision, it will always succeed. It will never fail. The visions of God never fail. Never fail. This anointing does not only bring salvation, it brings healing, it brings delivering, deliverance. We need that anointing. And we get it through an encounter with Jesus Christ. He is the anointer. I'm not the anointer. Bishop is not the anointer. But Jesus says, I will pour out. He will give us the anointing. I want to close with a dream I had some time back. I was in that dream in a, in a throne room. And there, it was a beautiful throne room, and I saw a glazing light on the, on the left side of me. I could not even look into that light. It was so bright. And then I saw a lot of people in that room. They were lining up, and immediately I realized why they are lining up. They wanted something. They needed something. They wanted the anointing. And then I saw one person also in that queue. 
And that person walked towards that throne, but always looked at the watch. And I realized that person doesn't have time. He's so busy. There is so much to do. Do I need the anointing? Why do I need the anointing? I've got my own skills. I've got my own money. I've got everything. Why do I need that? I can do without it. And then I realized, well, maybe he needs it. So he continued walking. He stops again. And while he was walking and stopping and considering, I, in my dream, I wanted to shout, Don't go with the anoint without the anointing. And he walked and suddenly the person turned around in the middle aisle, walked out. And I shouted in that dream, don't go without the anointing. And I saw that person outside laying hands on people, but with no effect. I heard this person preach, but it was, every word was like an empty bullet A, a hollow shell that fell to the ground. Nothing happened. And when I woke up, it rang in my heart, don't ever go without the anointing. And I said to the Lord, Lord, let me never go without the anointing. And I pray this morning that we not only receive, that we not only have an encounter with Jesus Christ, but that we receive the Holy Spirit that we need, we need the anointing of Jesus Christ. This anointing will not only break every yoke in your own life, but you will be empowered to go with the Holy Spirit to break the yokes on the lives of the people. Blind eyes shall be opened, the cripple shall walk, the death shall be raised, and the people shall be set free from sin, from, from all kind of bondages. Why? because he never changes. Don't go without the anointing. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you for this morning, this afternoon, this day. And Lord, I pray that each one here in this room, each one behind the monitor, wherever they are, have an encounter with you. Jesus, you died on the cross for one purpose, so that we can be free of sin and we can be reconnected with the Father. But you have also sent us, not without power, not without love, but you have sent us and given us your own spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is here this morning to empower us so that your heart not only starts burning, but your whole life will become a flame for Jesus. I'm an evangelist and I don't want to finish any message without giving you an opportunity. If you have come to church maybe for the first time, maybe many times, maybe you live a religious life and you know about Jesus. You even sing in the worship. And like Philip says to the Ethiopian treasurer, do you know whom you worship? Do you know what you worship? But you have never ever had a personal meeting a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and this morning while all eyes are closed for one moment I want to ask you do you want to give your life to Jesus and say Jesus take hold of my hand I have messed up I had my own visions my own dreams my own ideas but it all failed but today I want to start new with you I want to pray for you. Let me see your hand very quickly. I don't want you to leave this room and give the devil any opportunity to go home without an encounter with Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Don't be ashamed. Jesus was not ashamed. Yes. Thank you. And if you're on the monitor right now, Kneel wherever you are and give your life to Jesus and he will take over. But with the last minute I have, I want to ask a second question. 
Maybe you know about the Holy Spirit. Maybe you have been baptized into the Holy Spirit. You speak in tongues. But you have lost that fire. That fire went down. There is no passion for the lost anymore. I want to tell you one thing. Mary, she ran back. Because something burned in your heart. The disciples ran to Jerusalem because something burned in their heart. And you are called. I believe there's people here this morning. They are called to run for Jesus. To run for Jesus. The, this world needs your message. I want to ask that question. If you know you are called to go, to go and tell the others, to go to tell this generation about Jesus Christ, but you feel fear, You don't have that power inside of you. Don't feel the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. I want to pray for you right now. Lift your hand wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we all need that power. The power, the fire of the Holy Spirit. Thank you. Come on, let's all stand. Let's all stand. Come on, let's all raise our voices for a minute. Let's worship Him. And I believe... We have laid a foundation. I believe next Sunday when the bishop will speak, the fire of God will fall and we all will experience once again what happened 2,000 years ago. And we don't have to wait. I believe you have the desire. He will fill you right now. Holy Spirit, I pray this very moment you have seen the hands wherever they are. Lord, I pray that you fill them with the fire of God that breaks every yoke and in the name of Jesus right now I break every yoke of sin I break every yoke of fear I break every yoke of depression I break every yoke of sickness in the name of Jesus we cast out every lie of the devil in our life and I pray Holy Spirit that you will fill those wonderful men and women young and old to become ministers, flames of fire for you to go with boldness, with love, with power, and with a sound mind.